She's a great lady. Welcome, my mother. Would you do that? I got my wedding ring on. Yes. I'm married to it. I took a vow. I took the oath of office. I made a commitment. I will change my world. Humbly, yet fervently, I come. I'm surrounded by thousands of intercessors, nameless ones, who have heard the call of the Spirit from another world. They have joined me in a commitment to pull souls out of eternal fire. Yes. On January the 27th, 1903, fire broke out in a London lunatic asylum. Of the 300 inmates, 50 perished, and 250 had to be literally pulled out of the fire. Every sane man and woman went quickly to help, to help pull people out of the fire that were literally burning up. The time was short, their doom was certain, the work was great and urgent, so every other interest was set aside. Uh -huh. One thing was needful, and that was to rescue as many as possible yeah. before they literally burned up. It wasn't easy. Some laughed at the mention of fire, some said, do you think I'm going to leave my bed in the middle of the night and go out? They hid under the beds. Others thought it was a joke. Some fought the rescuers, biting them, tearing their clothes. Some were heard knocking at the closed door to get out. But it was too late. But 250 were literally pulled out of the fire. So it isn't easy to pull them out of the fire. No one said it was, not Jesus, not the apostles, not the martyred saints, but they did say that all sane, blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled, Jesus' name, apostolic believers should make it their business to get as many souls pulled out of the fire, whatever the cost. How shall they, the lost, here without a preacher. Okay. How shall they believe if someone never tells them? How shall they hear without, say, a preacher? Say, a preacher. A preacher. A preacher. A preacher. Not a pulpiteer, a, a preacher. And how shall the preacher preach except he be sent? We need preachers who have been called from another world and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they've been called, that they've got a message that belongs to the whole world, that will preach everywhere they go, not just in a pulpit, pulling people out of the fire. Preachers, if that's not your consuming passion, plainly put, you need to do something else. You need to save yourself a world of frustration and do one of the other things. Be a lawyer. Go to a medical school. Drive a truck. Program computers. None of them require a divine call. But if you're a God-called preacher, then you ought to prepare better than a trial lawyer facing the biggest case. You ought to study harder than a doctor preparing for brain surgery. 
You ought to stay more alert than a trucker hauling a nuclear bomb. Because if the lawyer loses his case, his client goes to jail. Yours goes to outer darkness. If the surgeon's hand slips, his patient spends 30 years in a wheelchair, yours spends forever in hell. If the trucker breaks concentration, his mistake blasts a hole the size of Yankee Stadium, yours drives off into a bottomless pit. They'll never get out of there, folks. They're there now begging for one drop of water. I don't care whether you believe it or not. There is a hell and a literal burning lake of fire where people will go that hasn't obeyed the gospel and they're begging for one drop of water. Preachers, we have the toughest job in town. That's pulling people out of the fire. Teaching and training them to pull others out of the fire. If you are a God-called preacher and inwardly believe in your divine calling, all the devils in hell can't stop you. Demons in this earth cannot stop your effective ministry. You will win souls and you will build churches and you will snatch souls out of the burning. So you're a preacher, is that right? Is that what you call yourself, a preacher? Is that what you are? So you're a preacher. You need to be more interested about altars being jammed with souls and seeking God than the status quo. You need, to be, you need to be more concerned about souls than Robert's rule of orders. You need to know the Bible so well, you need to know it better than an attorney knows the law and a doctor knows his medicine. You definitely need to know it better than the devil knows it and he knows it and can quote it. The Bible is not an edited book. God literally tells it like it is. And the book says there is absolutely no place in the kingdom of God for spectators and Sunday morning Christians. And God has requirements for everybody sitting in this room. He made a powerful investment in every one of you. And He wants a return on His investment. And if you do not give it to him, you may well hear him say, Depart from me. Give me what you took from me. I'll give it to somebody that will do something with it. Not much sacrifice demanded from us today. Not, not much cross-bearing. Not much witnessing. We want to be as comfortable as possible. Flitting from ecstasy to ecstasy. Following the current evangelist heartthrob from New York to Los Angeles. My cum laude friend, don't waste the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't waste this mighty powerful baptism of the Holy Ghost. Don't waste the name that's above every name in heaven and in earth. Don't waste the mighty powerful sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I've been sent with these mighty weapons to snatch souls out of the fire, whatever the cost. And if I'm not going to use them, I'm going to give them back. John Wesley, the noted reformer, spent 15 to 18 hours a day praying, studying, and preaching. Right. Traveled a quarter of a million miles, not in a 747, but mostly on horseback. Uh -huh. Conducted 40,000 public services at 85 years of age. Uh -huh. Preached no less than five times every day, said, I plant one foot in hell and the other in eternity, and I snatch as many brands from the burning as I possibly can. Yes, sir. Charles Haddon Spurgeon pastored Metropolitan Tabernacle in London a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. Brian and Renee Bozier flew me there to see it because they knew how I admired his work. Spurgeon said, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, begging them not to go there. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go there unwarned or unprayed for. Don't abandon a soul to hell that you can keep from going there. 
I read your book, Jerry. Terry, I read your book. It's powerful on the book of Acts. That's how Spurgeon felt about it. But you know what? Spurgeon isn't there anymore, snatching souls out of hell. And now it's nothing but a little shell there. And they talk about how it used to be. Because there ain't nobody there snatching souls out of hell. Why are those today that will cry out, If you're going to hell, you'll go there over my dead body. If you're going to hell, it will be with my arms around your knees begging you to be saved. I'm tired of reading about men and women like that. I'm tired of reading about prayer revivals and an Evan Roberts and the prayer revival in Korea. I'm not going to just run the aisles here and jump and shout, turn things upside down here. I'm going to get out there and turn my world upside down. We don't need you turning things upside down in here. We need you to turn things upside down out there. I remember hearing preachers when they were so desperate to reach souls after they preached, they'd put the Bible at the front door and beg people not to walk out over that uh, Bible and plunge headlong into hell. Where does that burden go? There was an urgency. There was a burden. There was a fervent, compelling force. There was somebody knowing the terror of the Lord pulling souls out of hell. Where's your fervency? Where's your burden? Where's your fire? Where's your concern? Preacher? So you're a preacher, is that right? I was in Super Warm Christmas. Saw a beautiful woman, I told her so. She said, what's your name? I said, Vesta Mangan. She said, would you pray for me? I said, I'd be glad to. She said, I'm not ashamed. I said, well, honey, I'm sure not ashamed. I grabbed that little hurting, beautiful woman's hand, and I began to pray there. Honey, I had a healing line right there in Super One before I got through with her. I was on the plane going to San Diego. I saw this handsome young man sitting to my left, and he was very courteous and genteel. And uh, I, I waited my time, and he had to uh, uh, get out. And so I was a lady, and I stood up and let him out. When he came back, I began to talk to him. When I began to talk to him, he was a man that led his family to prayer every night. But when I told him about what was happening here, Terry, and the uninterrupted prayer for almost 30 years, praying in three-hour shifts, he began to weep. And I didn't embarrass him, but I just laid hold of his hands and prayed for him. He was on his way to where the big football player or the big basketball player that's just retired. I don't know their names, but anyway, he's going there because he wants to go there and stay in Chicago. But that's where this lucrative businessman was taking his employees. He said, ma'am, I'm coming to your church. That's all you got to do, honey, is just reach out. If you say you've got it, my God, let him out and let him get all over somebody. They want him too. They want him too. <laughs> on the way back, I watched the man on my right and the woman to my left, and it was his wife and, the, and their daughter, and they were headed to West Indies. I got to talking to them about what's going on, and uh, I got to pray with them. And guess who they were? The owners of ABC. And I told them about Peter Jennings being here in this church. They were thrilled to death. They want to come visit this church. They're all around you, folks. You've got something that, that they want to feel. Let them get close to the fire. Let them hear something. Hallelujah. It's a ready harvest. They've tried everything else and everything else has failed. Please won't you let him out and let them feel something. I was at Rapids just last week. Rapids Hospital got in the elevator and they rolled a man in on a stretcher and there was the male nurse and others. And I said, would you mind? And I just laid my hands over there and began to pray for that man. He began to weep. I let him know where I went to church. I don't know what will come of that, but I touched him. That's all I got to do. And God said, I'll do the sovereign part now. I may 
may not win them all, but I'll snatch some out of the burning. If Elisha can put his mouth to a dead boy's mouth and breathe into him life, I can do more. I'm an artesian well. I'm springing up. Hallelujah. Many waters can't quench it. Neither can the floods drown it. It's as an army with banners. It snatches souls out of the burning. Hallelujah. Say all else is of little value. You'll understand that. Jude, half-brother of Jesus Christ according to the flesh, as brother stood halfway between Joseph and James, he never attained the high position of his brother James in the church, but he copied him in signing himself Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And when he preached or wrote, he was like the prophets of old. His little book slipped in at the Bible's end is a masterpiece. Jude, like his brother James, the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, never got what Jesus was driving at until... Three days after the incredible events in Jerusalem, but when he stood stunned and speechless with some of Jesus' followers as they looked into an empty grave, then he began to put it all together and comprehend what had happened. After Jesus appeared to each of them in a resurrected body, Jude, and please indulge me to say it like this, was shook. He was convinced that Jesus Christ claims to be the mighty God in Christ for the purpose, not just of a doctrine, but for the purpose of reconciling a lost world unto himself. And that Jesus Christ was no longer his half-brother, but he was his mighty God in Christ. Then, as he writes his powerful, pungent little half sheet of paper, nearly 40 years have passed since he was there standing at the empty tomb. And so much had happened in the interim. As Jesus had promised, Jerusalem was now a heap of rubble. Happens. Spoiled and debauched by Titus, the notorious Roman general. Now the Christians are scattered throughout the Mediterranean, suffering horrible persecution, much hurt and even death. Moral insanity ruled in Rome. It was a pleasure-mad world, much like our world today. Lovers of pleasure, ease, and comfort more than lovers of God and souls. But Jude could never shake the shock of that empty tomb. Death had died and immortality had come to light. And Jude just couldn't shake it. He wasn't interested now in laying up treasures here on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. He realized his time was short, eternity was unending, and there was a lost world and that every soul was going to live forever somewhere, either with the angels in heaven or the demons in hell, and you just couldn't shake it. He could never forget those 40 days that shook the world. Those 40 days Jesus spent with them in his resurrected body, eating fish and honey in a resurrected body. He could never forget how he so carefully nailed down the purpose of his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and all he had come to accomplish, and making sure it was in safe hands and was to continue on before he ascended. All that he began to do and to teach, now Jude is putting it all together. He recalls his many parables and figures of speech delineating his eternal purpose from the foundation of the world. He remembered hearing him say as though it were yesterday, I am come to cast fire on this earth and oh, how I wish it were already burning in me. But it will cost me drinking the bitter cup Pouring out my life's blood, treading the wine press alone, it will cost me to bring Holy Ghost fire. And again, I say, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Don't waste the Holy Ghost. Don't waste the precious blood. Don't waste the name. If you're not going to use it, give it back. It costs too much. He remembered hearing him say, I'm come to seek and to save the lost. I am come to redeem, to buy back souls from eternal damnation in hellfire. And all souls are mine no matter how they are packaged. I love all souls and I'm not willing that any should perish. Jude would never forget hearing his voice as it rang out over the Judean hills. 
For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He remembered hearing him say, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. Cast them into... In, cast them... Ca it is better for thee to enter into the life hall to maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell. We remember, Jude said, hearing him tell the story, say, of the lost sheep. Say, the lost coin. Say, the lost son. And yes, Jude remembers how he was really shook when he heard him tell about the rich man and Lazarus and how both men lived and died and were buried. And in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom and cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, that's impossible. There's a great gulf fixed, so they that which would pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There's a great gulf fixed. Once you're there, you're there forever. As a tree falleth, so shall it be. And then Davi said, then if that's not possible, I have one more request. Could you please send someone to my five brothers lest they come to this horrible place of torment? Remember, the Bible is not an edited book. Jesus tells it like it is. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And that's hanging on every one of us. Every Holy Ghost believer is to make sure every creature hears. The five brothers are waiting for every one of us. One hundred million unchurched in the western world. And so you and I sit here. Oh, 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 oh. It's got to get a hold of us. Save the people. Don't spare the gourd. Save the people. And so Davi said, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Send somebody who's been shaken. Send somebody who's been to hell and back. Send somebody who's convinced that there really is a place called hell, a lake of fire, where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Send somebody who knows that hell is no joke. Send somebody who knows that hell is no swear word. Send somebody who lives for eternity instead of time. Who loves souls more than they love life. Send somebody who's willing to forsake all to become fishers of men, pulling them out of the fire one by one. Don't send an average Pentecostal who doesn't have a burden. Don't send an average Pentecostal who wouldn't know the difference between a cross and a Christmas tree. Don't send a normal Pentecostal who doesn't care about the lost and the hungry and the maimed and the unfortunate of the world, who doesn't want a prayer meeting of intercession. They want only to be entertained. They just want to make a good living and have it easy down here and let the world go to hell. Don't send somebody that wants to sit amongst the 90 and 9 and just shout and jump and juke and jive. No, send somebody that knows what hell is like that's been there and back. Souls are plunging into hell. Don't send somebody that don't care. Don't send somebody knocking on my door that will ever leave me alone. Keep, keep standing. I looked at Paul a Sunday night. Uh, I'd come home from the conference. He was here for his first time. George had brought him. George is just getting established. He had brought this man that owns all the alarm system and puts all of those in in Alexandria. I looked back there. I didn't know he had back problem. I said, Paul, I don't want to embarrass you. I ju I'd, I'd just gotten his name. I said, I don't want to embarrass you, but God's going to heal you and save you. Took a little while, but Paul's here today. It's unbelievable. Wave your hand, Paul. Plunging headlong into hell. I said, if you ever try to go back to one of those bars, look over your shoulder. I'll be coming in there sitting down on that bar stool with you. Send somebody a 
said to me that will talk like that that's shaken. Who believes there's a literal burning lake of fire. Lose your wealth. Lose your health. But don't let a soul go to hell that you can keep from going there. Because of the times 1999, you know what we need? A mighty shaking. We need a new revelation of who we are, the name, the word, the Holy Ghost, the blood. We need a revelation. We need to know about heaven and hell. We need to know that time is short and eternity is long and hell is hot. We need to get awake. We need to wake up. We need to quit playing mama pig. Hallelujah. We need to play for keeps. I'm not talking about Y2K or XYZ or MOE or 88 reasons. We need a revelation. We are so puny to what we claim to be. There ain't no devil scared of most of us. Because we ain't never shook one of them. I'm not powerful in any other place. But when I get here and the anointing is on me, he better not come looking for me. I'll chase him back to hell. I've got all of you all around me. That's why I'm going to stay with the bunch. That's right. That's right. We need a revelation that will revolutionize every one of us and make us the violent. Say the violent. Take it by force. Tear down the gates of hell and snatch them out. I can't stand it. That's all the devil's got to gate. And a gate don't move unless you move it. And say, I'm a moving them. And everything that's behind it, I'm going to snatch it out. I'm knocking down hell's gates every day. I'm going to knock them down and snatch every soul I can that's in behind there. I'm not, ju I'm not even a preacher. Did you know that? I'm not even a preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm just a little uh, challenger. But they turned me loose. So I, I got to go on. Because I'm convinced. I made up my mind unconditionally committed, I'm going to pull as many souls as I can out of the fire. Please indulge me. It won't take me long. A lifetime ago, I met a man. Oh, Gerald, what a man. He would change my name and would forever change my life. Gerald Mangan was a flaming evangel stirring the country and having revival everywhere he went. I met him in one of his revivals in a little old sawmill town called Dyball, Texas, just south of Lufkin. That was 57 years ago. 100 people were filled with the Holy Ghost and they had to crack the ice on the old mill pond to baptize them in Jesus' name. He was dynamic then, he's dynamic now. Prays three or four hours every day, won't leave his room until he prays through the tabernacle plan. Fast several days a week. Went on a seven-day fast all of those 57 years and now at least 50 people who lit, their, who lit their flame by his life in this church goes on a seven-day fast one to two times a year. He asked me to marry him. And before I could say, just tell me when, he said, now before you answer, I need to share some things with you. I'm committed for as long as I live to my ministry, to the call of God and apostolic Jesus' name message. I'm committed to having revival and pulling souls out of the fire, whatever it cost me. I'm committed and nothing's going to come between me and my commitment. I'll be praying hours a day, fasting several days a week with occasional lengthy fast. Do you think you can handle that? I'm asking you to commit to fasting at least one day a week and praying at least an hour a day. Now, if we cannot be a team committed to revival and saving souls, you, God can just kill one of us. I said, now, wait a minute, Gerald. You're taking this thing a little too far. If you don't want me, somebody else does. Okay. That's been almost six decades ago. But time has not changed that commitment. 
And nothing I can say in the next precious few minutes given me today would ever measure up to those 56 years of total commitment to a man, to a message, and to a mission. That was only the beginning of a restless power, an insatiable thirst, and a consuming desire that sent me in quest of something so big and so powerful that was about to happen in my life, and it did, and it is still happening. I really don't belong here. I wouldn't even testify the first five years of our marriage, but something got a hold of me from another world. Lake Charles, Louisiana, we had gone to sleep and rivers broke loose on the inside of me and I couldn't stop them. I woke Gerald up and he said, my God, what's happening to you? I said, Gerald, it was back in the days where women barely got on the platform. I said, don't get scared. He ain't calling me to preach. But I said, you'll never have any trouble out of me. You may be sorry you ever woke me up. I shed that little old traditional Pentecostal girl, vanished into a ministry of prayer and fasting and pouring out my life to reach the lost. We hit this city, knocked on every door. We knocked on their back door. They finally came and said to get rid of them. They're knocking on our front door and back door. We got to go. <laughs> this city has been covered four times, knocking on every door in this city. We mean business. It's more than a profession. If they didn't even give them a salary, I don't care, I, I can eat, I can drink branch water and eat cold cornbread. I'm going to get sold. I'm knocking down hell's gates. That's right. That's right. Anybody want to join that kind of a living? commitment with me it's a magnificent obsession the devil said I couldn't do it but I did and the very fact that I'm speaking here today is a testament to a life of dedication and total commitment and by God's help and grace you ain't seen nothing yet I'm gonna finish my course I'm gonna keep the faith and I'm gonna give it to everybody I see and there's a crown laid up for me and I'll see you at the judgment I heard Dr. Billy Donomohori Ahaswada Hahaji. I heard Dr. Billy Graham being interviewed, and they said, uh, Billy, they called him first hand basis. Billy, don't you feel very gratified after these 78 or 79 years that you've touched the whole world? He said, No, I don't. Feel like a failure. How is that, Billy? He said, I wish I'd have got more things straight on the inside of here. Wish I'd have prayed more for a lost world. I hope all of those that I've preached to and reached that somewhere other that they will even be able to make it. He said, I walk in on my wife every day now and all she's doing is reading the Bible. She is studying the Bible like she never has. He said, I wish we'd have done that many years ago. Wake up, Pentecostals. I don't intend to eat anybody's dust. The chariots are moving swiftly and I'm not lingering behind. I'm moving on with anything that's a moving. I'm going with it. Hallelujah. I'm going to reach as many as I can reach. Say, if God is not real, nothing matters. But if God is real, nothing else matters. All else is of little value. Jude looked out upon a lost world plunging headlong into hell where heresies had risen and false teachers did abound. He vowed to do something about it. He appears as a man with a whip of cords cleansing the temple, taking his wrath out on an apostate at ease in Zion, materialistic, professing church. But as he hastens to conclude his little half sheet of paper, abruptly he changes the subject matter saying, here is our only hope in any age, and especially in the day just before the rapture, the age of apostasy and deception. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Ghost, so you call yourself an apostolic preacher, called to preach the gospel to every creature, and you don't pray? Gypsy Smith said, you're a walking fraud. You are a hypocrite. You have no right to be in any position of apostolic leadership if you don't pray. Especially as pastors when you ought to be building a house of prayer in every city. And make it a center of victory for every dope addict and for every 
have a dysfunctional family? Build up yourself. Your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. You cannot pray... You cannot prevail before people until you prevail before God. You've got to worship with the seraphim before you're ready to worship with the people. You cannot lead people to where you have not been. What you plead from the pulpit, you've got to example and demonstrate in your own personal private life. Or you're a hypocrite. So you're a preacher, is that right? Only when you come from the presence of God can you lead people into the presence of God. You ought to be a mediator, an intercessor in Christ's stead, bringing God to the people and the people to God. You ought to spend the best hours of every day in communion with God. You ought to give yourself to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Give yourself to something that's going to last. And the only two things that's going to last are souls and the Bible. Everything else is going to pass away. You just might as well wake up, honey. I don't care how much you got. It's gone. And it ain't going to last. Your souls and the Word's going to stand. So you as a preacher above all else are to be distinguished as a man of prayer to establish a lifestyle of prevailing prayer. That's the most decisive element in your spiritual success. And the apostolic command says first of all, prayer. To pray without ceasing. You say, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? It means what it says. It means exactly what it says. Pray without ceasing. So you're an apostolic preacher, is that right? Well, let me tell you something. That's the apostolic standard. And you need to start with the apostolic standard. Don't lower that standard. You say, well, there's an identity standard for your women. What about your men? I'll give it to you. Men ought always to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. That's a pretty good mark of separation. That's a pretty good mark of identity. And if you're not doing that, I don't want to hear your other... things first. If you get a hold of God, you don't care about nothing else. Somebody ought to scream out, my God, save me, forgive me, have mercy on me. Every man in here, I don't care. You ought to go around praying everywhere you go without ceasing, lifting up holy hands. That's, keep on. That's why Paul could shake off vipers and cast out devils. Turn the Roman Empire upside down. God still hearkens to the voice of a man. Tell me when to stop. Tell me. Make it plain. His anointing last night. He and Mickey and their children sustained strength. Under God, the holy anointing, it is the supplication of this church. And you look at me. They've got that kind of a church. For we know when they are anointed and blessed and it's coming forth to us, we're blessed. They transfer that anointing. So I'm praying for them every day. Gerald and I are here to do anything that any of them needs done. I'll go anywhere, do anything. I mean that, folks. I'm sold out. If you don't believe that, come and live with me and follow me around. And I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you I'm going to get worse. I believe it. If we have a praying people around us, we can do anything. But when we cease to pray, Ichabod is written on the place of our assembly. And Jude continues saying, now, despite all of the deprivation and the persecution of the pain, keep yourselves in the love of God. Love one another as I've loved you, for love is the most powerful, potent force on planet earth. Love unifies, and where there is unity, there is strength, there's power, there's fire from heaven, there's a sound from heaven, there's cloven tongues of fire. Where there is unity, there's faith. Faith works by love, and where these are, say anything can happen, and will. 
So Jude says, persist in a loving attitude and a behavior through the Holy Ghost. Warn, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Save others from error when you can and when it's possible. Don't let any fall into hell when it is in your power to prevent it. To prevent it. Have compassion on them, pulling them out of the fire. Proverbially, they are insane. They are in a burning asylum. And hell is not a swear word. It's not a mental institution. The enormity of Calvary tells you there is a literal burning lake of fire. It's referred to as outer darkness, everlasting fire, punishment, everlasting chains, wrath of God, second death, everlasting destruction. Say, I don't want to go there. Say, I don't want none of my people to go there. I don't want nobody. I wouldn't want a dog to go to hell. I wouldn't want a cat to be burned up. And hell is a place of eternal destruction where their smoke ascends up forever and forever and forever and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Say lake of fire. And the Bible is not an edited book. You tell it like it is. Say this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Having said that, say somebody is responsible for getting names written in the Lamb's book of life. So every church should consider itself an eternal fire department. Every Christian should have his place on the hook and ladder. Jude, Jesus' brother, challenged us to pull him out of the fire. But you know what? All too often, the spiritual fire department never gets to the scene of the blaze, but spends more time back in the firehouse arguing about who started the fire, who's responsible for it, or even what's the best method to put out the fire should anyone ever get to it. A good fire department is comprised of conscientious, dedicated people who doesn't care who gets the glory, who considers their occupation as more than a money-making job. It's a life-saving agency. No wonder they have pride. Their equipment is always in readiness. Their apparel is handy. Their training and expertise are apparent. Now, is that the picture of our church and your church? If not, we don't have a right to exist. Powerless churches and pastors who do not win souls must share the blame of godless America. Every man and woman, boy and girl in this church has got to learn to be a Christian soul winner and, uh, uh, because it's for all flesh. Say our children have to be involved in prayer. They have to be involved in the harvest. You ought to see them here in every service praying their little friends. I mean five and six year olds getting the Holy Ghost and turning around laying their hands on others praying them through to the Holy Ghost. Say, God said, let none perish. Say, the Holy Ghost said, it's for you, for your children, for all that is far off. Handmaiden, servants, say, everybody ought to be talking in tongues. Everybody ought to be telling it. Everybody ought to be rescuing. Almost a half a century ago, living out the principles of the book of Acts, we captured the imagination of this little city with a few on fire in the company of the committed. Daily in that little church on 16th and Day Streets, from house to house, we ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So excited to pray, exciting to pray them through in their homes, find Brother Mangan to baptize them in Jesus' name, and on and on. That's been the story of this church. Praying in the Holy Ghost, finding souls, pulling them from the fire. One church, one person, one family, one nation at a time. Now, for 18 years, under the very capable leadership of our pastor and his gifted, godly wife, Mickey, upward 300 in Sunday school, a packed house in every service, with a family life center second to none, for multiple purposes, reaching, teaching, discipling, and unifying families, a new auditorium on the drawing board. There's no telling us what God's about to do if we continue to pray in the Holy Ghost. Show mercy. Have compassion. Spend whatever you've got on them. As he told us last night, and God said, when, you, when I come back, I'll repay you. Seek and save the lost. They pull them out of the fire. Brother Mangan preached the funeral of a little boy in this city that had whose little charred body had to be pulled from a burning house because he didn't make it. They had to handcuff his mother. It took four or five officers to put her in the police car and drive away. We saw that. 
But how would you act if your child, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother were in a burning house? Do you want anybody you've ever met, met to go to hell? Jesus said, don't fear them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and slam them into hell. If we tarry till the morning, some mischief is going to befall us. If we hide our gold in our tents and hide our light under a bushel, if we do not witness to our cities, we can never rule with him over cities. How can we expect souls to be saved if the church is not travailing? If we haven't done well, how can he say, well done, eyes closed?